Well, good morning, second hour. Welcome back. Let's talk about what we're doing this very short week. So I'll briefly go over the schedule for the week as per usual. Then I get to give you a lesson on a new author. In fact, a new subgenre of writing out of romanticism. So today I'm gonna to tell you about a guy named Ralph Waldo Emerson. And we're gonna learn about the genre he started called transcendentalism. We will read two small essays, and I mean small. One of them's like two pages. That's nothing. In fact, one of them I will read with you to help you out. And then you'll complete the prompts on your handout, which I'll show you in a moment. Just a reminder, next Friday is the last day to get in late work from weeks one through seven. This includes all three quizzes from quarter three. I still have at least four quarter three quizzes to grade. So if you're one of those folks, that's next on my list. Uh, I have the wonderful problem of people have handed in a lot of work. I'll take that problem. That's a wonderful problem. So here is the same info, just broken down for you in a checklist. I do have open office hours this week, Wednesday from two to three. So if you need a little extra help, click this link at that time, or you can send me a message and we can set up a different time if that works out better for you. Just a reminder of some info here to transition for next week. So I kept that in here for you. So this week, like I said, we're gonna work on Emerson and Transcendentalism. We'll start that with two essays. Next week, we'll continue Transcendentalism with the other main author of it named Thoreau. So we'll read two of his essays, same kind of deal. So I tried to plan these first two weeks back from spring break light so that you have time to make up any missing work if you have it. And then, of course, week nine is the last week of quarter three. So that's going to be the absolute deadline for all week eight and nine work. But the main thing is getting in those quizzes, as I keep saying. All right. So let's show you at this point what your handout looks like. So you know where you're going to write answers and what answers you're going to need to write. So we're continuing this week with text citations that are correct. We're practicing this because your next summative assessment is a compare and contrast paragraph on any two authors or works in this unit. So you'll need at least one text citation from them. You can reuse a correct text citation in any of these handouts. It's another reason why we're practicing it. So this week, your work is formative. So first, tasks one and two, you're gonna show an understanding of transcendentalism and why Emerson is significant, as well as correctly identifying uh, the answers for the essays. And then you have at least two text citations in your answers that are in correct form. And yes, I will review what that looks like for you today. All right. So we'll start here with task one. If you haven't opened up week seven yet, I would do so right now, because after I review this, I'm gonna give you the answers to this. I'm gonna teach you the stuff. So first, you're gonna write two characteristics of transcendentalism. And notice up here, it says, don't Google answers without giving credit to the sources. It's better to take my answers, frankly, they're free. So you need to have at least two characteristics of transcendentalism. I've included one already here for you. So they have three main beliefs. This is one of their main beliefs. They believe people are born good and they should follow their own beliefs. And of course, these examples will be in the green folder by the end of the week for you. All right, next you're gonna write at least one reason why Ralph Waddle Emerson is significant. In other words, why is he important? So I wrote, his religious crisis led to transcendentalism. If you wanted to simplify that, you could also just write, he started a new type of writing. Here for task two, so this was general, I'll be teaching you this info. And then when it comes to the essays themselves, those are on PDFs. 
in week seven, and I'm gonna read self-reliance with you to help you get these answers. So you can go ahead and preview some of the things you're gonna be looking for. When we read self-reliance, we're gonna be looking for one of the reasons why Emerson says people don't trust themselves, why people are conformists. Then you get to decide which of the transcendentalist beliefs, there's three, do you think is shown most in this essay and why you think it. And then for your why you think it, remember, at least two of your answers need to have a correct text citation. So you could easily just give a line from the text. Then you're gonna choose a piece of advice or an opinion from this essay and then your reaction to it. And you're gonna do the same kinds of things for the essay nature. So in these answers, I'm not looking for complete sentences. It's not like that. I'm looking for, do you know how to do at least two correct text citations? And did you get the reading? Do you understand? Simple comprehension. All right, so let's teach you these things. So first about Emerson and then the genre he started. So here's Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was a very different guy for his time, I'll tell you that. And he still is quoted quite a bit now, that's why we study him. So just like our last author, Washington Irving, Ralph Waldo Emerson was a prodigy. So this means he was really smart from a young age, basically. He started Harvard at the age of 14. Imagine a ninth grader going to Harvard. That's how smart Emerson was. He came from a long line of ministers. So his family were in the preaching business. He had very strong faith. He was a minister and he was successful at it, but he quit. And this is the significant part. He quit because when his wife died, he, he loved his wife very much. And when she died, he had a crisis of faith. In other words, he really started to question God and how we approach God. He was very clear that it wasn't that he didn't believe anymore. It's that he was pained and felt the relationship wasn't viewed correctly. So in order to come to that conclusion, he took some time off. He basically studied while he grieved. So he studied literature, religion, philosophy, read everything he could get his hands on while he figured out what am I going to do with my life now that my spark is gone. Here's what he ended up doing. So four years after he quit preaching, he published the essay Nature, which you're gonna read today. And he formed a club of people who had similar ideas to him. And this club, and it was in New England, the club, and they would talk about philosophy, they would talk about life, and they would talk about God and their place in the world. So this became the Transcendental Club. Transcend means to rise above. So these were people who were trying to make their lives better, more holy, if you will. So by the 1840s, Emerson was famous for his writing and for his lectures and for starting transcendentalism. Lectures were really popular back then, kind of like how people watch influencers, Twitch, you know, YouTube now. Same kind of deal back then. You can make quite a bit of money going from place to place and just reading one of your essays or writing out a lecture. And since he had that religious background, he was a really good public speaker. So that is Ralph Waldo Emerson and why he's significant. If you haven't written anything on your handout yet for why he is significant, I would say he started transcendentalism or was a famous writer who had a religious crisis. So like I said, transcendentalism means to rise above. So here's what transcendentalists believed. You need to write at least two things on your handout. So this is a subgenre of American Romanticism. So these folks like the American Romanticists. They believe in pushing against industrialization. They don't like that. They're nostalgic about the past. Sometimes there's elements of the supernatural not so much with transcendentalism, uh, not so much the supernatural part, aside from belief in God, depending on your view. So transcendentalism was started by Emerson, like I just said, 
And it started with a club and then it became uh, more of a literary and philosophical group. Um, it branched not only across America, but it started moving across to Europe as well. So one of the things the transcendentalists believed was they believe you get to transcendent forms of truth, in other words, higher truth, through intuition, not reason and experience. This caused some issues in America. There are quite a few people who didn't agree with this. But the transcendentalists believed that you should trust your gut. Your intuition was put there by God. You should trust that more than what has happened to you before or more than what you read. Trust your gut above all things. And that'll get you to higher truth. They also believed, and this was different from what was former, formerly believed, as you recall from reading the Puritans, the Puritans believe that people are born bad and that they have to wash off original sin, basically, by going to church and doing good deeds, you know, following the rules. The transcendentalists believe that people are born good. You're not born with sin. Not only are you born good, you inside, inside all of us, you have a compass. You should follow your own beliefs. In other words, people are born knowing what's right. Emerson and his friends really believed this. They believed you should re you should rely on yourself and be who you are, because how you are is how you were made by God. As you can imagine, religious leaders did not like this last belief, especially because some of the transcendentalists went one step farther and said, you don't need to go to church. You don't need someone to help you interpret God. You are connected to God. You're part of him. So there is some fighting about this for sure. And then the last thing the transcendentalists believed was they believe the humans, God and nature are all connected. So they believed if you're having a tough time with your faith, you need to go outside. You need to go take a walk in nature and get reconnected to the universe, essentially. They believed in this idea called the all soul, where they believed everyone's soul is a piece of the universe. So we're all connected to one another and to the world. And they believed that that was because God designed it that way. I keep stressing that their beliefs keep going back to God because many people, when they read Transcendentalists, assume that these are atheists, that they don't believe at all. And that's not the case. It's the opposite. So here's just another way of looking at transcendentalism. As promised, I'm going to review text citation for you. So when we're reading the essay, it's easier for you to get your two correct text citations. So when you have a text citation that's set up like we do it, MLA style, you start with the quotation mark, then whatever from the text you want to quote word for word. At the end, there's no punctuation. There's end, punctuate, there's end quotation marks. Then in parentheses, you got the author's last name, in this case, Emerson, and then the page number. Do not write P dot, just page number. So author, page number. Then close parentheses, and then the period always goes right here. As I said before, this is the biggest mistake I see in text citations, is folks forget to add the period right after. All right, so I have that in your slides for you so you can refer to it whenever you need to. I also have Ms. Fedora's version of the Transcendentalism slides. Um, one thing I want to show you that might be easier for you is she has very neatly put all three beliefs on this one slide. So while you're working, if you need to reference like, oh, what were the three beliefs again? I don't remember. Right here. A little bit easier for you. All right. So at this point, I'm going to switch to the essay itself. I'm start with self-reliance. And I'm getting this from Schoology Week 7. And like I said, I said I would read you at least this essay to give you a good start. And, you know, we're back from spring break. I, I think it'll help get you back in. So Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So this is an essay, meaning when you refer to it, don't call it a story. So don't say an Emerson story, say essay, work, or writing. So this is him showing some of his transcendentalist beliefs. Self-reliance. So one of the things you have to decide as we read this is which of the three beliefs is this? 
There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse as his portion. In other words, you gotta, you gotta just be okay with who you are. That though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him, but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground, which is given to him to till. To till. In other words, if you've ever heard someone say bloom where you're planted, same idea. So this is establishing the idea that even though there's a lot of differences in the universe, every person is born with their own soul and has the job of nurturing it. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron strength. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. In other words, it's, you were not, it's not an accident where you are. It's not random. It's divine. It's by God. So accept where you're at and use it. Work with what you got. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. So in other words, if you're going to be a man, truly a man and not a child, you have to follow your own path. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Absolve you to yourself, and you shall have the suffrage of the world. I remember an answer, which when quite young, I was prompted to make to a valued advisor, who was wont to importune me with the dear old doctrines of the church. On my saying, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions if I live wholly from within? My friend suggested that these impulses may be from below, not from above. So in other words, Emerson is having a debate with his friend about why do I have to follow the church rules if I know I'm foreign divine? And his friend said, oh, that's, that's the devil. I replied, they do not seem to me to be such, but if I am the devil's child, I will live them from the devil. So in other words, it doesn't seem evil to me, but if so, whatevs, I'm going to do my best with what I got. No law can be sacred to me but that of my nature. Good and bad are but names very readily transferable to that or this. The only right is what is after my constitution. The only wrong, what is against it. So again, trust your gut. You know right and wrong better than the laws do. What I must do is all that concerns me, not what the people think. This rule, equally arduous in actual and in intellectual life, may serve for the whole distinction between greatness and meanness. It is the harder because you will always find those who think they know what is your duty better than you know it. It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. So in other words, don't follow the crowd. Follow your own mind. For nonconformity, the world whips you with its displeasure. And therefore, a man must know how to estimate a sour face. The bystanders look askance on him in the public street or in the friend's parlor. If this aversion had its origin in contempt and resistance like his own, he might well go home with a sad countenance. But the sour faces of the multitude like their sweet faces, have no deep cause, but are put on and off as the wind blows and a newspaper directs. In other words, people's opinions are fickle. Don't let their opinions sway who you are. You should stay true to you. The other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency. A reverence for our past act or word because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts, and we are loath to disappoint them. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, 
and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. today. So in other words, you should be open to be wrong because truth is a daily thing. Ah, so you shall sh be sure to be misunderstood. Is it so bad then to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. So that's the first piece by Ralph Waldo Emerson for you. You folks have the rest of the time to either finish your answers to that first essay on the handout, or, and or, continue on. You're also going to be reading Nature. As you can see, it's another short essay. It's even shorter than the first one. All right, so you have two little readings and some writing to do. As always, if you need help, I'm here to help. Use your time.